I've got a lot of cameras, so is everybody good and rolling and whatnot? Some thumbs up when everybody's ready to go. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so, so yeah, let's get started here. Um, my name is Fallon Owens. I work with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission as the Extension Wildlife Biologist, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about coyotes in cities and suburbs and generally residential areas, um, what you can do about them and uh, their biology, a lot of cool stuff. And we're going to have not just me speaking today, but we're also going to have a representative from the Charlotte-Mecklenburg Police Department, Animal Care and Control Division, to talk about their part of responses to coyote issues and a certified wildlife damage control agent who's going to talk about what they can do about coyote issues. So we're kind of going to learn a lot about who does what and who doesn't do what in terms of responding to coyote problems. So again, this is kind of what we're going to cover here today. Um, where did coyotes come from in North Carolina? And what are they like in the state? Um, believe it or not, not all coyotes are the same depending on where you are in the United States. Um, what impacts do they have, especially to people, and what can we do about them? So first off, we want to talk about how coyotes got here. This is not a native species. Historically, they did not live in North Carolina. Um, historically, they lived in the Midwestern United States um, on the other side of the Mississippi River. And you can see on the screen their historic range, uh, which is pretty expansive up into Canada, down into Mexico, but not anywhere near North Carolina. And in the early 1900s, their, their range actually started expanding. And believe it or not, it was kind of because of people and what they were doing on the landscape. Um, human beings were, were killing off a lot of their, their competitor uh, predators. So wolves, uh, bears, and mountain lions um, were extirpated or went extinct locally in a lot of areas. And those were the, the major other predators. So coyotes didn't have anybody to compete with. Um, also, the way human beings change the landscape actually make um, the land much better for coyote survival. So it was people populating the United States that really helped coyotes to thrive. Um, so I'm going to show like a time lapse of how their range expanded across the 1900s. You've got 1920, you can see in orange how their, their range, and these are from historic records of actual sightings of coyotes or harvested carcasses. And then there's the 1930s, 1940s, they're expanding uh, further north and, and east. 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, okay, by the 70s, they've crossed the Mississippi River and they're expanding further towards the eastern coast. And then in 1980, now you can kind of barely see that little green addition on there, but that's when they're right on the edge of North Carolina, that natural range expansion. So I'm going to zoom into the southeastern United States now and show in the mid-1980s, this is where there were confirmed sightings of coyotes. This is where they existed at that time period. And the little red dots are actually confirmed areas where we know that there were illegal releases of coyotes, mostly for, for hunting purposes. You know, people who wanted to be able to hunt coyotes uh, brought them in to these areas and released them. And so there was kind of two things happening with coyotes expanding into the east. One was that they were just coming in on their own four feet. And the other was that in some instances, instances, they were being brought in by people. And that's one of the things that happened in North Carolina. This shows um, the, the early to mid-1980s in North Carolina. These were the first confirmed sightings of coyotes in the state. And you can see there's, there were sightings all the way on the coast um, near the Albemarle Peninsula. And really, it doesn't make any sense they would be out there other than that there were illegal releases of coyotes in that instance. But then we see their range expanding in the, the late 1980s. By the 1990s, that coyote range expansion from the rest of the United States was starting to hit the western part of North Carolina. So they were coming in from Tennessee and Kentucky. And then 1996, 2000, 2003. And by 2009, they had been documented all the way on the Cape. Um, North Carolina, so they're pretty much everywhere by now. All right, what, what are coyotes like in North Carolina? Um, they are about the size of maybe a Labrador or maybe a female small German Shepherd, 
And I get a lot of calls from people that say, you know, I, I saw like an 80 pound coyote, 90 pound coyote. Um, they actually are pretty scrawny for their size. And so, so a coyote that's about the size of a domestic dog is gonna weigh much less than a similarly sized domestic dog. So they really only max out at around 40 pounds in North Carolina. There are a lot of bone and a lot of fur for the most part. Pretty scrawny because they have to work really hard to survive. Uh, so they don't keep extra bulk on their bodies. They also have a really narrow rib cage so that they can um, run around through the brush so they can't have like a big barrel chest like domestic dogs do. They also vary in color. We've got coyotes from uh, beautiful bright blonde to gray to reddish all the way to black. So um, that can be a surprise for people when they see a black coyote, but that's just uh, the, the, color, um, the color varieties that they come in are here. All right, what is coyote habitat? Can anybody guess what in this picture is coyote habitat? It's all coyote habitat. Oh. Yep, yeah, it's all coyote habitat from forests to beaches to golf courses, even suburbs and downtown areas of cities. Um, there's a really popular or a, a kind of a famous research study in Cook County, um, Illinois, around the, uh, the Chicago area. It's a long-standing research study. They've been studying coyotes that live in downtown Charlotte for years. Or not Charlotte, excuse me, um, Chicago, because coyotes do very well in, in um, even downtown, really, really urban areas. Uh, so this is important to know. They, there's not a place in North Carolina where coyotes wouldn't be. They really can be anywhere. In urban areas, they do tend to try to stay away from people as much as possible. So a coyote is more likely to be found where people are less common. So that's going to be green spaces, you know, the, the creek that runs through the neighborhood that's really brushy, or somebody's backyard that they never go into. Coyotes want to be where people aren't. That's not to say that they won't pass through your backyard or your neighborhood, but in general, if you're around, they don't want to be. And you can see on this, this map, this is overhead views of Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, there were some radio collared coyotes that were part of a research study that were passed through Raleigh. And for the most part, you can see they were found in those green spaces. So that's where they prefer to be because they don't want to be bothered by people. That said, this is a map of the coyote reports in North Carolina from 2018. So the, the deeper the red, the more reports were received by the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. And what you can see is those dark red areas are actually our urban centers in the state. So not only can coyotes survive in urban areas, but uh, they can be pretty common in urban areas. Now I don't want you to interpret from this that there are more coyotes in the city than there are out in the forest. But what this means is that there are more people in cities and suburbs to see coyotes. And most of the time, they're more likely to report a coyote sighting because they weren't expecting to see a coyote. So what this shows is basically coyotes are everywhere. There's not a place in North Carolina where there are not coyotes. All right, moving on to what they eat. So just like that previous slide about coyote habitat, Everything on this slide constitute a potential, a potential addition to a coyote's diet. So that's going to be from, um, from small animals uh, like rabbits, moles, voles, mice, things like that. They are technically carnivores, but they are also omnivorous, meaning that you know, they, they will eat whatever they can get a hold of. And that can include insects, that can include fallen fruit, domestic animals, um, and they'll even eat nuts and berries and things like that. So, so all of these are potential food items for coyotes. And the interesting thing about coyotes is they tend to specialize and focus on eating whatever is most common on the landscape. So they're not gonna take a bunch of time to go after that one really, really rare thing. They're gonna eat whatever's most common and they're gonna get really good at, at finding that item so that they don't have to work as hard to eat because it's hard to survive out in nature. This graph right here kind of shows that a little bit. These are two separate diet studies that happened in North Carolina. One um, on the Albemarle Peninsula, Alabama coast, and one in Fort Bragg. 
And what they did was they studied the feces. They, they, broke, they collected the feces of coyotes and broke it down and figured out the contents, figured out what the coyotes were eating. And you can see there's, there's a big difference between the two. Um, the main component of the coyotes diet in the Albemarle Peninsula was small rodents and rabbits. White-tailed deer, those are usually fawns when they're first newborn and can't run away very well. Um, and then you get vegetation down on the bottom. But on Fort Bragg, the primary food item that coyotes are eating is fruit and insects, because that's what's more common on Fort Bragg. So, so they are incredibly adaptable, and they'll eat whatever's there. Another very important thing to know about coyotes is that they have an incredible ability to disperse. They're very adaptable, and what they do when they leave, when a young coyote is ready to leave its parents' territory to go out on its own and find a territory of its own, they can travel incredible distances in order to find an unoccupied territory where there's not already a mated pair of coyotes. So what they're looking for is someplace where there isn't already a coyote, and they will travel upwards of 300 miles to get to that piece of land where they can establish themselves as their own territory and there are no other coyotes around. Uh, this was the research study where the coyotes were radio collared, and what you can actually see is this is one female that dispersed from its, its uh, natal territory, and it started out, let's see, it started out in Fort Bragg, I believe, so you can see over here, or, or, started out over here, <laughs> and it went all the way down to South Carolina, all the way to the edge, almost to Georgia, and then decided, eh, I'll go back, and it went back and it kind of found that spot where you see that, that uh, dark, dark area of, of dots, and that's where she ended up staying. And that total trip, let me get my cheat seat here, the total trip, straight line distance from start to finish was 188 miles. So she, she traveled more than that, but um, she ended up in total traveling 188 miles to get from where she was born to where she ended up staying. This is another individual from that same study. This one went north. And it ended up going all the way across the border of North Carolina into Virginia and established itself in Northern Virginia. So that was, that was about 226 miles that, that that one coyote traveled. And this is really important to keep in mind when people start talking about, well, you know, I don't like coyotes. How do we get rid of them? So the fact of the matter is that if you get rid of coyotes in a small area, those young coyotes, when they're ready to disperse, they're going to recolonize that space. On that same note, one of the reasons why coyotes are so adaptable and they're so just capable of surviving is that they can actually change their reproductive behavior in a way that's dependent on whether or not there is a lot of mortality, whether or not there are a lot of coyotes around. So, when there are a lot of coyotes, and most of the landscape is, is kind of covered by coyotes, there's established coyote territories in all of the available habitat, what happens is the litter sizes are going to be pretty small, you know, maybe four, four coyote <coughs> pups in a litter. And the survival rate of those pups is not going to be so great. Maybe half the coyote survives, so two out, out of a litter might survive. And the young that are produced from that litter usually are going to take several years before they can establish a territory and find a mate and be able to reproduce themselves. So this is when the landscape is kind of full of coyotes, this high competition situation. They lower their reproduction. Now, if there are no coyotes around and the habitat is just kind of open and available, there's lots of resources, coyotes will amp up the, the amount of pups that they'll have in a litter sometimes nine, 10, 12 pups in a litter, and the survivorship of those coyotes will skyrocket. So a lot of them will survive. And because there's not a lot of coyotes in those outlying territories, it'll be easier for those, those young pups to disperse, find an unoccupied territory, find a mate, and reproduce at a young age. So they can reproduce at, at a year old in a situation like that. So, so they really are adaptable depending on how many coyotes are in the surrounding landscape. When you get a situation where there's high mortality, where coyotes are, are uh, dying at a high rate from whatever cause, 
that lowers the competition and you get more new coyotes. They'll ramp up their reproduction, ramp up survivorship, and they will compensate for that mortality pretty quickly. But if there's low mortality and the landscape gets completely suffused with coyotes and there's not a lot of available territories left, all the area is taken up, then they lower their reproduction and they lower their, their the, the pups won't survive at a high rate. And so basically, they can regulate their own population. So when people talk about, we need to get rid of them, we don't like coyotes, how do we get rid of them? How do we get them out of here? Um, it's, it's actually something that is not, it's not possible um, because of their adaptability and their, avail their ability to increase reproduction, their ability to disperse and occupy unoccupied areas. Um, it's just not really feasible. Um, studies have shown that it takes removing over 70% of the coyote population in an area annually, every year, for several years before you can even start having a dent in their population. And then of course, even if you were to eradicate coyotes in a small area, coyotes from the outlying area are gonna find it and they're gonna recolonize. So eradication just isn't really possible. But it's also not really needed. And what I'm gonna talk about after this is kind of what, what can you do? What can we do about coyotes? So this is a list of the perceived risks from coyotes based off the reports that the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission receives and other entities like animal control departments, uh, police and other wildlife specialists. They get a lot of calls in North Carolina about coyotes because people are afraid. And these are the, the common complaints. People are often worried about disease. Um, they're worried about coyotes having rabies. Coyotes attacking children is often a really common worry. You know, that they're out there, they're in a neighborhood, you know, they're gonna go after somebody's child. Um, there's a lot of fear that coyotes will go after people's pets and livestock. And there are, there are fears that coyotes are impacting other native wildlife that we have in North Carolina. The actual risk from coyotes based off of what we know, looks a little bit different from that though. The actual risks from coyotes involve habituated individuals. These are coyotes that have been intentionally or unintentionally fed by people and they've lost their fear of people. So those individuals are called habituated and they can cause problems. Coyotes are a risk to off-leash dogs, especially small breed dogs that look a whole lot like a rabbit. Um, and coyotes sort of natural prey item. And even larger dogs can be seen as competition. You know, a big dog looks a whole lot like another coyote, and uh, that can cause skirmishes. Outdoor cats. For better or for worse, coyotes eat cats. They're about the perfect size for a coyote to eat and to, to snatch up really quickly and easily. Um, so, so coyotes are definitely a threat when it comes to outdoor unsupervised cats. And then also, in a similar vein, unsecured, vulnerable livestock. And when I say vulnerable, I mean smaller livestock, like chickens, poultry, um, like sheep, lambs, sometimes even calves, smaller, smaller vulnerable animals. And the good thing about this is that everything on this list is, for the most part, a preventable situation. We can do something about all of these situations. I want to take, give you a little bit of time to look at this. Um, this chart shows the reported complaints that the Wildlife Commission received in 2017 and 2018 regarding coyotes. Now, everything in orange is a complaint that didn't involve any kind of real damages. Um, they're mostly, mostly fear-based or you know, somebody was just complaining, but the coyote hadn't really done anything. Everything in red is a situation where there was actual damage involved by, from a coyote. And you can see at the top of the list, there's a whole lot of orange. <clears throat> Most of the complaints that the commission receives revolve around, we've got presence in area, perceived threat to humans, perceived threat to pets out during the day. We even have aggression toward a pet, but there were no injury involved. You know, maybe a coyote growled at a pet or something like that. 
We don't actually start to see damages until we get all the way down to outdoor cats injured and killed. And because that is actually the biggest threat that coyotes pose on the landscape when, when people are involved, and that's coyotes eat cats. Further down, and that, that's only 5.5% of all the complaints received. Further down, we've got poultry injured or killed at 3% of complaints. That's mostly backyard chickens. And then down further, you've got a dog injured or killed at 2.7% of all complaints. And those, those dogs are almost all small breed dogs that were off leash that were outside, unsupervised by their owner. And then down at one, one and a half percent, we've got livestock injured or killed, and so that's gonna be probably sheep, goats. So most of the complaints that we receive don't actually involve coyotes causing any damage. And the damages that are caused usually involve a small, vulnerable animal outside, on its own, without any human supervision. And that's something we can definitely do something about. Again, I was talking about uh, you know, actual or those perceived risks. A lot of people are worried about coyotes having rabies. Um, this is a graph showing all of the, the rabies positive tests in North Carolina. This is from the Department of Health and Human Services from 1990 to 2018. And we've got the big heavy hitter rabies vector species on here. Very clearly, you've got raccoons, that's the top one, skunks, foxes, bats. Those are the, the species that we call rabies vector species because they're, they're more likely to contract rabies and potentially transmit it on to other animals. Then we've got cats, dogs, and then there's a little sliver that says other. When we break down that other slice of the pie, we get all the other species that have tested positive for rabies over that time period. And you can see we've got a slew of all sorts of interesting things. Cows, bobcats, rabbits, and possums. Coyotes are number four on there with 18 confirmed positives of rabies across that entire time period. And if you really look, was it about four times as many cows tested positive for rabies across that time than coyotes? So by all means, coyotes as a mammal are capable of, of contracting rabies but it's just not something that's incredibly common. Again, to kind of put things into perspective, I have this quote from a research study that talked about coyote incidents and, and reports about coyote damages. It says, um, Baker and Tim in 2017 said, between 1970 and 2015, 367 reported coyote attacks on people across the United States and Canada so there were 367 attacks, and two of those were fatal. But over that same time period, 4.5 million reported attacks um, were from domestic dogs on people just in the United States. And in 2016 alone, in one year, 31 dog attacks were fatal. So, you know, that chart I showed before that showed the calls that we get about coyotes, and I can, I can show you again this, you know, number one, presence in area, the biggest complaint, perceived threat to humans. This is the reason why a lot of people are upset about coyotes, they just don't like them being here. But the fact of the matter is, the chance of you getting you know, injured or attacked by a coyote is just relatively slim, and there are much more dangerous things out there. That being said, coyote management is important. Thinking about trying to eradicate them from an area might not be feasible, but there are ways that we can manage coyote conflicts. First off, we want to keep them wild. Remember I said that habituated coyotes can be a problem, and those are the animals that have lost their fear of humans. Coyotes are naturally incredibly skittish. They're, they're afraid of their own shadow, but they're also very smart, and they're very capable of surviving. So if they learn that people can be a source of food in the form of any number of things, um, and no harm comes to them when they hang around people, then they learn from that, and that's when a coyote can become habituated. So we want to keep them wild. We want to maintain that natural wariness around people. 
I'm going to talk about how in a little bit. Another important part of managing coyotes is our behavior. We have to manage coyotes by managing our human behaviors. What we do on the landscape, what resources we provide or don't provide, have an impact on what coyotes are doing out there. So this is a huge part of managing coyotes, changing our behavior. Also, it's important that if there is a problem, if coyotes are causing some kind of issue, we need to focus on managing the damage and preventing that problem, preventing that damage from happening anymore instead of trying to eradicate the species itself because coyotes are not going anywhere. They are here in North Carolina and they're going to be here forever. So we need to focus on what the actual problem is and manage the problem, not the species. And there's a link here to the Wildlife Resources Commission's website about coyotes. It has a lot of very great information on there, so I, I strongly encourage you to write it down and look at it in your free time because there's some fantastic resources there. So continuing on this theme of management, how do we manage coyotes? Let me, let me talk about how the Wildlife Commission manages coyotes. First off, we manage the hunting and trapping seasons. So there, there is a hunting season and there is a trapping season for coyotes. And the Wildlife Commission determines what those seasons are gonna be, what equipment can be used during those seasons, and allows people to legally harvest those animals via these methods. Outside of the hunting and trapping seasons, we also have an avenue where people can deal with coyotes um, if, if it's not a time where they can be hunted or trapped. So then we call it depredation control. So there are options sort of outside of hunting and trapping to remove coyotes that are causing damage. And that's what's very specific and important about depredation. That's when an animal is causing damage. So it might be out of season, but if the animal's causing damage, then you have additional options. And probably one of the, the biggest ways that we manage coyotes is educating the public, helping people to change their behaviors to prevent issues with coyotes in the first place. That's why all of you are here. Okay, so going into a little bit more specifics about the, the, the seasons that we have for coyotes, because they are not a native species to North Carolina, um, our, our regulations on when you can hunt coyotes is actually fairly liberal. It's a year-round hunting season. So 365 days out of the year, someone can hunt coyotes if they have a hunting license and they follow all the other local rules. So the hunting license costs about $20. It lasts for a whole year and you can hunt coyotes year-round. You can hunt coyotes at night, which is not the case for most, most wildlife. And you can use electronic calls to attract them. So these are really liberal um, in terms of the opportunity to harvest coyotes. There are some additional restrictions in the Albemarle Peninsula because that's where the red wolf population is and red wolves and coyotes are really hard to tell apart if you don't have them really close to you. So I won't go into details about that because we're in Charlotte right now, but that's sort of an additional consideration. And local laws are always going to apply. Now, this is incredibly important when you're talking about coyotes in a residential area or an urban setting. As in, um, you know, the city of Charlotte has an ordinance that prohibits discharge of a firearm. So even though coyote hunting season is in 365 days out of the year, because the city of Charlotte says you cannot discharge a firearm, you cannot hunt coyotes with a gun in the city of Charlotte. So those local laws are always going to apply as well. Okay, trapping. Trapping season is a little bit more restricted because the traps that are used to, to catch coyotes don't just catch coyotes, they catch other, other animals too. So, so the trapping season is restricted to November 1st to the end of February. And if you wanted to trap coyotes, you can follow the regulations, get a tracking license, and you can harvest them during that time. And we actually have um, a guest speaker, Andrew Cole, with um, Swamp Dog Wildlife, who's going to be coming up um, once I'm done to kind of demonstrate how that works. As I mentioned before, outside of the trapping season, if you've got a problem with a coyote that's causing damage to your property or causing a real issue, you can actually get a depredation permit that allows you to track that coyote even out of season. But that animal has to be causing some kind of damage. 
This is a really important point. What do you do with a coyote when you catch it? If it's a problem in an area and you want it gone, a lot of people's first instinct is say, well, you know, I want to relocate it. I don't, I don't want any harm to come to it. I just don't want it here. But legally, you cannot relocate coyotes, and for a lot of reasons. Um, one important one is that, as I said before, they can travel incredibly long distances to get to where they want to go. And once they've established a territory, they want to be there, and they have very strong homing instincts and have a powerful capability of getting back to where they came from. So relocating a coyote usually doesn't accomplish very much, except a lot of wasted time. Also, where are you going to put a coyote? You know, if you don't want it in your yard or in your area, there aren't a lot of people who want coyotes released on their property. So it's, it's really difficult to find out where you could release a coyote. They're not native. That's a reason, one of the reasons why it's illegal to relocate them. And disease. We don't want to relocate the diseases or parasites that coyotes are carrying. Uh, rabies might not be a huge issue with coyotes, but they can carry ectoparasites that live inside their body, ectoparasites outside their body, and other diseases that we don't want transmitted around. So basically, for a lot of different reasons, you cannot relocate coyotes. So when a coyote is captured with the intention of removing it because it's causing problems, there are really only two options. One is going to be euthanasia, putting the animal down. And there is, it is legal to actually relocate and release that animal inside a licensed fox hunting preserve. So there's a chance that it could be released alive, but it's going to go into, into a preserve where it's going to be hunted. And those are really the only things that you can do with a trapped coyote, other than releasing it from the trap and letting it go exactly where it was trapped. All that said, you know, what, what should we do about them? And it really does depend on the problem. What exactly is the issue that the coyote is causing? Because depending on the issue, that's going to um, really have an impact on what the appropriate response is going to be. So there's a lot of non-lethal options that I want to talk about first. What you can do if you have coyotes in your area. So non-lethal options are going to be great if there's coyotes in the area, but they're not causing any issues. And you also want to go, you're going to focus on preventing the problems from happening instead of being reactionary and dealing with the coyote after problems have been caused. So prevention is very much key. And the first thing that you need to do if you want to prevent problems with coyotes is find anything that might attract coyotes into your yard or in, into any area where you don't want them and remove those attractants. Attractants for coyotes come in a lot of different forms. Um, they're really adaptable, so they'll go after pet food. Obviously, that's a great source of nutrition for them since dog food especially is designed for canids. So that's like pre-Christmas dinner for a coyote. Um, garbage, unsecured garbage, they'll definitely take advantage of that. Um, they will eat bird seed out of bird feeders, and they will definitely eat the small animals that are attracted to bird feeders, from mice and rodents to squirrels and birds any animals that they can get a hold of. So bird feeders can definitely attract coyotes and fallen fruit. You know, they're omnivorous, so they're perfectly happy to eat fruit. So these are sources of food that usually aren't out in nature that we provide on our landscape that we can remove so that we're not attracting coyotes into our area. In terms of animals, all of the, the animals in this, this uh, slide are definitely going to be on the menu for coyotes if they're available. The important thing to note here is that the bottom three, cats, small breed dogs, and poultry, these are all things that we have control over. So we do not have to put these animals on the dinner menu for coyotes. We can keep these animals safe by keeping them inside keeping them on a leash, or keeping them in safe enclosures that are coyote resistant or coyote proof. And just supervising them when they're outside. Even just being there. Again, coyotes don't really want to be present when people are present. They don't want to interact with us directly. So just being there can be a great way to protect your, your pets or livestock. But if you can't be there, keep them inside or keep them in an enclosure where they're protected. Real quick, I'm going to talk about these coyote vests. 
this is a product that has become popular on the market. Uh, there's been some news coverage about it. And it's basically a vest that you put onto a small dog that's got all sorts of spikes and projections coming off of it that is meant to deter coyotes from being able to grab the pet. And you know, people ask me all the time, you know, well, do they work? And my response to that is, eh, maybe. So certainly they're going to deter a coyote from grabbing a small animal very quickly. I mean, they would have to try maybe a couple of times to be able to, to get a good hold on the animal. But best or not, research shows that when small dogs are picked up by coyotes or taken away by coyotes, the biggest factor that was involved was that people were not around. There was nobody within an immediate vicinity and the dog was just kind of out in the open by itself. So I would say this might be a potential deterrent, but the best way to keep your dog safe is to just be close by because you are the best protection you can have to keep your pet safe. I would always advocate, you know, keep a, keep a small dog on a six foot leash. Even those extendable leashes, they can get pretty far out. So just keep them close by. And if you see a coyote, you know, pick them up. The closer they are to you, the safer they're gonna be. And I talk about coyote proof fences. If you want your animals to be able to run free outside, one of the best ways of handling that is keeping them up inside a coyote proof fence. And basically, you know, coyotes are canids. They're a lot like dogs in some ways. And if you have a fence that's dog proof, it's probably going to be coyote proof too. And I'm talking about a dog that's pretty agile, that can jump pretty high, and also is a really good digger. So a good coyote proof fence is going to be at least six feet tall or have projections on the top of it that prevent animals from climbing over. So I've got an image of a coyote roller here. That's a device that's like a rolling pin that spins whenever you try to grab it so animals can't climb over it. In the other picture, there's kind of a lattice that hangs over the fence that prevents any animal from climbing over. And it needs to go underground too to prevent any kind of digging activity underneath. So if you have a fence like this, you know, not only are coyotes not going to be able to get in, but your pet's not going to be able to get out. So it's a win-win situation. For cats, the answer for people that want to be able to let their cats outside, um, this isn't always going to be a great option because some cats are already very familiar with being outside. But if you can, I would say, if you want to have cats that go outside, a catio is a really great option. It's a way for them to enjoy the outdoors, but also be protected in an enclosure that keeps coyotes out. And I, I just looked on, on Google, there was, there was a pre-built one for $500. So, you know, that may or may, may not be within your, your budget, but you know, you can certainly get creative with it. And here's an example of, of a catio that somebody made that connected to their window so the cat can go in and out whenever it wanted to. So this can be a really creative option. You also want to look at places that might attract coyotes as just a place to get away from people, a place to hide. So they, they want to be away from human beings and they want to be in thick cover because that's where they feel safe. So, you know, a good thick brush pile or you know, an old abandoned shed or something like that. You know, these are areas that coyotes might decide to rest in when, you know, they're not moving around. And if you have any places like this, especially if they're really up close to your home, you know, I would want to keep, keep those areas close to your home clear. And by all means, these are great places to provide habitat for wildlife, but maybe, you know, on the far edge of your yard. <laughs> maybe not right, right up close to your, your house. And always know, you know, if, if it's going to be a great place for wildlife, it could be a good place for a coyote to take a nap. Okay, what should you do if you see a coyote? Um, a lot of people say that when they they had a coyote encounter and they saw one, you know, in their yard or something like that, they say they, they ran into their car, or they they ran into their house, and they just got away because they were so afraid. And I'm not going to say that that's the wrong way to respond because keeping yourself safe is always going to be the highest priority. But in terms of teaching coyotes that being around people is a really bad idea, what you should do is actually the opposite. Especially if you see a coyote in an area where you do not think coyotes should be, such as in your yard, you actually want to haze that animal and teach it 
this is a really bad idea, you shouldn't do this again. So I'm going to do a little hazing demo. Um, we call it hazing. Some people call it harassment. Basically, you just want to scare the coyote away, and you want to be persistent about it. So, you know, I'm not talking about just kind of like, oh, get out of here. You need to be persistent and scary as possible. So you need to be like, go, get out of here, get out. And you can throw things. If you had a water hose handy, you could spray them with a water hose. The intention is not to hurt the animal. But you want it to really understand that there are going to be real consequences if it sticks around. And a lot of coyotes, especially if they live in residential areas and they see people all the time, they might run across the street and look back. Just like, are you going to do anything else? And what you want to do is you want to be so persistent that you get them to leave. So, you know, maintain a safe distance. But if it crosses the street, turns around and looks back at you, keep coming towards it. You want to just keep at it, keep going until that animal definitely gets out and it knows that you mean business. A really simple thing that you can do is make what we call a coyote shaker. Just a soda can or a drink can with some pennies in it. You can slap some fancy duct tape over it to keep the pennies in there. And now you have a very sophisticated device that makes a whole lot of ruckus and you can throw it at the coyote. You're not going to cause any harm to it, but you're certainly going to scare it. And that's going to be much more scary than you standing really far away and just saying, oh, get out of here. If it's got a projectile coming towards it, it knows that you need business. So not only hazing the animal is important, but be persistent until it goes away. Teach it. It really needs to leave the area, or it's not going to be comfortable until that happens. Okay, so a recap on non-lethal op uh, non options. You want to remove anything that might be attractive to coyotes. Leash and supervise your dogs when they're outside. The shorter the leash, the better. Keep cats indoors. Coyotes eat cats, outdoor cats. They eat by coyotes, they get run over by cars. Bad things happen to outdoor cats. Um, keep vulnerable livestock in secure enclosures. Backyard chickens need to be in a good solid coop and run that keeps them protected from not just coyotes, but raccoons and hawks and owls and all sorts of animals. Everything loves to eat chickens. Um, haze them when you see them and definitely spread the word. Tell your neighbors, educate the people that you know that are in an area that has coyotes and make sure that they know how to respond appropriately and prevent issues. Okay, so all that said, when is stronger intervention necessary? So I said, you know, non-lethal options are great when the coyote isn't causing damages. Um, if it's just there and you want to make sure it knows how to behave itself. But if a coyote is habituated, say it, it has lost its fear of people and it has no problem just walking right up to a person, maybe because it's suspecting a food handout, begging, following people, especially at, at very close distance, or if you've got a coyote that you've been yelling and screaming at and throwing things at it and it just is completely unfazed, especially if it's acting a little bit strange and looks like it might be sick and it isn't really paying attention to you, these are situations that, that might require a different type of action. If there has been an, an aggressive incident, if a coyote has bitten somebody or, or has started going after people's pets and has um, a, Created or started to exhibit behaviors that are, that are problematic and, and showing a pattern, then you know that animal might need to be removed. And of course, if, if all the non-lethal options are not working, then you might have to move to something else. Again, what you need to do in this situation is not to say all coyotes need to go, we need to eradicate them from the area, but find the one individual that's causing the problems and remove that individual, and then the problem will go away. Again, just to reiterate, uh, eradication is just not possible with coyotes. If you remove them, then another coyote is just going to come and take its place. So the idea is to teach the local coyotes how to behave appropriately so that you don't have issues, not to just get rid of coyotes carte blanche. OK, um, I only have a few minutes, but I think I can get through all of this. I wanted to give one example of um, what's called escorting. 
So this is a, a situation that I get calls about sometimes. A coyote followed me from a distance and then stopped and just kind of watched me as I kept walking out of the area. And so was that was that aggressive? Was that a following situation? And in something like that, we call that escorting behavior. So the coyote hasn't approached, but it's definitely watching you and has, has just watched you and made sure that, that you have left the area. And that can happen for a lot of reasons. Usually it happens when somebody's got a pet that they're walking and the coyote is just keeping an eye on the, the pet, like the dog, especially if it's a bigger dog. They see it as another coyote invading their territory. So they might want to approach the dog, but they don't want to approach you, so they just choose to watch from a distance. If you're near the den, they will definitely post guard and make sure that you don't get closer to the den. Now, a coyote isn't typically going to attack because a person is close to a den, so they're going to watch you. And if you say if you were to go towards the den, then it might show sort of increasingly agitated behavior, trying to signal to you, you need to go away. Or if it has young pups, it's definitely going to, their coyotes are excellent parents, very excellent parents. So to prevent any issues from this, you want to make sure that your dogs are on a leash, because if you have a free-running dog that decides to go chase after the coyote, then you might have a problem when the coyote decides that it doesn't want the dog right up in its face. And you know, just leave the area. And usually the coyote will just watch you and sit down, and as you leave the area, it'll, it'll just disappear into the woods. Um, I also kind of wanted to talk really quickly about when we get reports about coyotes. So that escorting behavior is usually happening during the breeding season when they have pups. And you can see this, this graph actually shows the frequency of reports that we get, or the total number of reports that we get across the year. So you see January on the left, and the, our reports that we get about coyotes kind of peak in May, and that's when the pups are born. So coyote, the parents are awake day and night, working really hard to make sure that they get enough food for their pups. And then as the pups get older and they don't require as much food or they learn how to hunt on their own, then those reports kind of decrease a little bit. There's a lull in September. And then October and November, kind of where we are now, that's when the pups disperse and they go off on their own. So you get a whole lot of kind of young, sort of teenage coyotes that are wandering around trying to find a territory of their own. And they're, they're just everywhere and they're not as wary as adults, so people tend to see them and hear them more commonly during that time. So this, this kind of happens every year. We expect to see a peak of reports in the spring and in the fall, and it just lines up with normal coyote biology. All right, I only have a couple minutes. I think I can get through this. Let's see. I think a coyote needs to be removed. Now what? So again, if a coyote needs to be removed from an area, there is hunting and trapping that's an option. You have to follow all the laws and regulations. And if it's outside of season, but the animal's causing damages, then certainly you can get a depredation permit to legally be able to remove that animal. You can also hire what's called a wildlife damage control agent, which is somebody who is licensed by the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission to be able to remove animals in situations where property damage has occurred. And they can do more than that. They can provide um, advice on how to handle wildlife conflicts without actually removing the animal. They're a fantastic resource, um, but they can definitely remove an animal for you if that is necessary. Or you can invite a licensed tracker to your property and have them do it if it's during the tracking season. Um, let's see, real quick about depredation permits. Let's see. Like I said, they're only issued if the animal's causing property damage. You can't get a depredation permit just because you saw a coyote in your backyard and you want, you want it gone. Um, they are free. Now, if you hire a wildlife damage control agent to remove an animal for you, they might charge for the service of removal, but they can't charge for the permit itself. And you don't have to have a hunting or trapping license if you're removing an animal under a depredation permit. They can be issued by wildlife damage control agents or from a district biologist or a wildlife enforcement officer that works with the commission. So that is kind of what I wanted to cover for you guys. Um, really quick, I wanted to throw up some resources. If anybody has any questions about coyotes or any other type of wildlife, say injured animals or problem animals, and they, they just want to talk to somebody who can give them some answers, 
We do have a helpline, the North Carolina Wildlife Helpline. The phone number is there, 866-318-2401, and the email is hwi at ncwildlife.org. That is manned by wildlife biologists, whose job it is to answer people's questions. Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. They are an excellent resource. And if they can't provide the information you need, they can get you in touch with the right person who can help. Again, I got that website. Um, our Coyote webpage has got a lot of great information. And I'll leave this here, I think. That's just kind of more, more information on our website about hunting and trapping regulations, um, trapper education, um, and just general wildlife conflict issues. Um, I can leave that up here. And now I'm actually going to turn it over to Andrew Cole, who's a licensed wildlife damage control agent. He's gonna just talk for a few minutes about what happens when you call someone such as him to deal with a coyote problem. Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Andrew Cole. I am a uh, licensed wildlife control agent for the state of North Carolina. Um, I'm the owner operator of Song Dog Wildlife Management. I'm a member of NACOA and uh, National and North Carolina Trappers Associations. Um, what's important to note about wildlife damage control agents is that we are private individuals and businesses. Of course, that dichotomy is stretched out. You have large franchises and big corporate type businesses, and then you have individuals and smaller businesses such as myself. Um, so whenever we're doing a certain, you know, I do a lot of of technical guidance and provide a lot of information, do far more education than business with this animal, but when it comes to services, removal of a sick animal or trapping and removal service to target you know, a problem animal, you know, people are gonna pay for those, are gonna have to pay for those services. Not unlike a plumber or an electrician, we have to you know, account for our time and operating costs. Now, of course, those costs vary wi widely. You know, people have various types of pricing systems, you know, a setup fee and a per animal fee or a flat rate. Um, but trapping coyotes is, 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 trapping in general is very labor intensive. So if you get a price from somebody, don't be like shocked that it costs, oh my gosh, it costs $500 per week to, to you know, perform trapping services. Um, there are rules and regulations and laws we must abide by. A lot of the details, uh, uh, Fallon did a great job of covering, so I won't go into that stuff. But um, of course, when it comes to a legitimate issue, as stated before, I do far more education than business with the animal. Uh, but I want to see damage, loss, depredation, or endangerment. Uh, this animal is an opportunistic predator. Nobody in this room can speak with absolution about what the animal can and can't do truly. Majority of the time, it's not gonna be an issue, but there are plenty of incidents and occasions, and I've seen them for myself, where they have become an issue, such as coyotes coming over the fence and grabbing a dog. Even with a person standing in the doorway, they watch their dog go right over a six-foot fence. That happened right here in Villa Heights, right over across the east side of Charlotte, or a coyote running through a doggy door into somebody's kitchen. Uh, most of the time when I, provide, when I provide services, it's for ag, excuse me, ag producers or people who want to maintain and mitigate a population such as deer uh, managers who want to improve farm recruitment. Uh, I don't call it complete eradication or complete control. I call it corrective control when you're dealing with a problem animal. Because occasionally, the odds are that most of them are not going to be an issue, but occasionally you will deal with a a problem animal and you have to take actions. And of course, a lot of those types of things have been covered tonight. But again, uh, this is a depredation permit. I want to see damage, loss, depredation, and endangerment to issue this. And then of course, you know, charging for your services, inspections, that sort of thing will come into play. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. How are coyote issues handled by wildlife control agents? Um, like I said, if an animal is sick on site, they may, you know, take the animal by means of a catch pole or, or grab them and cage them right then and there. But if there's a trapping service that's required, uh, you know, the, the, an agent will come to your property, make an evaluation, scout the property, and then probably come up with a proposed uh, service to set traps 
Um, I'll go over some of these tracking devices. I brought a couple of the most, the, the, probably the three most common tracking devices for coyotes are the, the modern day foothold trap, the collar and throw snare, and the cage trap. Cage traps are not very effective because coyotes by nature are neophobes. They're very cautious. Some can be bold, but they are still cautious and, and very calculated in their decisions. So, uh, basically, you want to make a, a trapping set as natural as possible. So, you you know to, to you know fool the animal into thinking that you know there's something there that they want, and, and you want to catch them. Um, you want to be effective and efficient. And the most effective and efficient tool is the modern day foothold trap. The foothold trap is a highly misunderstood tool. It is used in wildlife research to catch and monitor and, and study animals. It is, it, while you, will, you can use this device, I can set the pan tension higher so I don't catch small mammals. I can use different types of lures and sets that are, more, that are geared more for coyotes so you're less likely to attract raccoons or the, the neighborhood cat. But in the event that you do catch you know, somebody's cat, this is a live trapping device. This is a a, uh, they, you know, they're basically, there are best management practices, BMPs that were formed by the Association of Fish and Wildlife to make sure that the welfare of the animal and the animal is treated, you know, humanely. So this is a live trapping device. It does not maim or hurt the animal. It is designed to catch the animal above the pad. So this is the way it works. It's better to keep leverage on the ground. This trap is then bedded in the ground, underneath the ground, and it's designed for when the animal comes up to it to investigate your, your trapping set, you step into the trap. Now the trap just firmly holds them. Now below here you have chain and a shock spring, so that will keep the, give the animal, you know, the, it, it won't get, the, you know, tear the animal up, it'll, and it'll provide you know some spring so the animal doesn't hurt itself or jerk its leg or something like that. So. That's the most common and effective tool for trapping and removing coyotes. This is a collar and throw snare. I don't particularly like this one, but the, the idea is that you have an attractive food type or a curiosity lure or bait here. The animal grabs and then just throws the snare around it the animal and catches them. Same thing, when, once this one throws around, it holds them like a leash. It's a shock spring to prevent the animal from hurting itself. Uh, those are just some of the two of the common devices used for trapping and removing coyotes. Um, and as stated, like I said, uh, Fallon covered a lot of the details of what happens, but you know, uh, when you trap or remove a coyote, um, you know, we have to, as wildlife damage control agents, we have to abide by the rules and regulations and laws. In a perfect world, you could take them somewhere where they wouldn't be an issue and they wouldn't come back, but that's not the case. Uh, they will return, you know, they can artificially spread disease. There's, you know, so when I talk to, when I tell people that, hey, if, you know, if you're wanting to have a coyote removed, these are the stark realities you have to deal with. Uh, and, you know, we have to euthanize the animal. Um, let's see here. And basically, if you want to try to reach out and find a wildlife control agent, we're listed on the state on the Wildlife Commission's website. Uh, you can also find us on the web when various forms of advertising. You can, you know, locate us. Uh, basically, like I said, there's a wide range of different types of companies. There's at least 40 agents I know of in the greater Charlotte area. So um, if you're in need for a wildlife control agent. Again, they you know, can provide technical guidance and education, but we also provide services and be aware that they you know, be charged for them. So I guess that kind of covers it. Awesome, thank you so much, Andrew. You're welcome. Can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so you gave the example of the Villa Heights uh, situation where the coyote jumped the fence, grabbed the dog, and then carried the dog back over the fence. So what are the odds of catching that particular coyote? And would you, I mean, is that something that you would think, well, if, if, they are, if that 
coyote already got the dog in that yard, then that's no longer a problem for that yard anymore. You know, I'm just wondering how that scenario could right. play out. Right, if you recall and during the Thomas talk about the biology of the animal, typically they're not like deer where they, you know, the, the population just builds and builds and builds in a given area. They're a territorial wild canine. So you're going to have a mated pair, a male and a female, that occupy and defend that territory. And then they're pups. And they'll have those pups in like, you know, late spring, early summer time frame, then then raise them up through the summer and then they disperse. Sometimes a subordinate female will be allowed to hang around, but typically when I go to a property and they say, oh yeah, there's this animal and they've got pictures of it, they show me what it looks right. like. If it's a black coyote with a big white blaze on its yeah. chest, I know which animal that I'm targeting. Plus, by the biology of that animal, that's the one that occupies and lives there. And okay. just because the dog was eaten doesn't mean that they won't be back okay. or that they don't come through there and signpost and hunt for rabbits. Okay. Again, coyotes are opportunistic predators. And so they may not be a, an, an absolute threat all the time, but they will certainly size up a situation. You know, if, if, if they show up in the yard for persimmons falling in the front yard out of a tree, you know, but then they see a cat or a dog, they see a food opportunity, they're gonna probably investigate it or go for it. So again, when I go to a place and I say, all right, I, if, if you want me to pay, if you wanna pay for my inspection fee, I'll come out there and make an assessment and, uh, and I'll interview the, the client and then they will tell me, all right, this is what the animal is, this is where the product, and of course, then through the trapping service, you'll know. And again, it's not complete control. Is corrective control. Now, if I go in and do trapping services, sometimes I do catch all of them. Sometimes I catch some of them. In some cases, I don't catch any of them. Um, and that's usually when those situations, when somebody else has been there, where I've gone behind other wildlife control agents that didn't have success, or they messed up, or something happened. Uh, but most often, the case you can catch some or all of the animals. But as Don was explaining in the biology we have so many coyotes across the landscape now is you create a vacancy, more will move in. But they're all individual animals. You know, coyotes, not only people, they have, they all have different behavioral traits and personalities, if that's the, you know, a word you want to use with regard to an animal, but they, they some are regressive, some are more timid. Uh, just depends on the situation and what the problem is. And, so they're all trying to find food in the city, and some stuff is okay, but like the pets are off limits. So once they cross that line, then they're they're going to be removed, killed. You, you know, it, it well not always. Now I will say, you know, this is what you can do. Just at the end, there was a couple slides there with the fences with the rollers on them and the crown. Some people use a, a you know a barbed wire crown or just a single strand of barbed wire or buried wire. That would fall into the category of prevention, okay. animal exclusion, um, animal proofing, um, keeping an animal, improving husbandry and, and, prevent, and preventing animals from getting on your property. Um, of course, that costs money too to do those types of things, but uh, they certainly can, can, can help uh, you know, prevent issues with your pets. Before we get too deep into questions, um, I, I actually wanted to, to give a couple more minutes to allow um, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department and Animal Care and Control Division to speak a little bit about what they do and what they don't do about coyote issues, and then we can open it up for questions. So hold your questions, and whoever wants to come up and, <laughs> and speak, you are welcome. <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Good evening. I'm uh, Bill Morrison. I'm an enforcement supervisor with Charlotte Mecklenburg Animal Care Control. Um, heard a lot of information tonight about what uh, what things are done and what um, trapping agencies do and what wildlife does, and kind of just want to give you some information on what we do here as Animal Control Agency for Charlotte Mecklenburg. Uh, what we do is we will respond to a call for service if a coyote is living inside rabies. Uh, okay. One, a few years ago up in Huntersville, probably saw a video of it tagging a tire that animal did turn around and turn out to be positive for rabies, but it's just one case. If they are sick or injured, the majority of calls for service that we receive are coyotes that have been hit by cars, 
or something because of the population we have here in the city. You know, they, they tend to ch be chasing stuff and it runs right out in the middle of the road. Right. Yep. That's the most kind of call that will respond. Thirdly, if they are actively aggressing somebody. So if in a scenario where somebody is cornered or something like that, <clears throat> we will respond along with patrol. Um, we do not respond to, but we get the majority of our calls regarding coyotes, we do not respond to are, there's a coyote in my back door, there's a coyote walking down the street. <laughs> Such like that, we do not respond to those. Um, another thing that I like to add is we don't set traps. Um, in certain very situations, if, if it is, if an officer does respond and it does show signs of rabies or something like that, we may utilize with uh, the Department of Wildlife Resources some scenarios about them getting involved in assisting us, but we don't have traps on hand to set for coyote specific. Um, that's pretty much what we do. We just we refer a lot of our calls unless it's an immediate threat, sign of rabies, or injured to our wildlife services agencies, and they can assist with those kinds of questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So so now you guys we can open up for questions. Um, and there were a lot of hands up for, for Andrew, so um, by all means, uh, you can ask questions to any of us, and there might be some from our online audience as well. I have lots of questions. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, I, have this, I find this so enormously frustrating and demoralizing that the party line is that you're never gonna be able to get rid of coyotes. There are always gonna be more. They're an uber predator that doesn't have, they're, they're not prey for anything. They're incredibly smart, they're incredibly adaptable, they're incredibly reproductively able, etc. etc. They're like this uber predator. And you know, first of all, I question, and I would drop a major footnote to say, you know, the statistics uh, collected, I think they serve their purpose in informing, you know, the policy and all of that, but I don't think everybody who loses a cat thinks, you know what, I'm gonna call the North Carolina Wildlife Commission. I'm going to report this, and I think the statistics are, you know, very, very skewed, very, very underreported based on what we've just seen, you know, in our little neighborhood app in Foxcroft. I mean, we track these coyotes everywhere, and people lose cats and, you know, hasn't shown up, and blah, blah. You know, it seems to me that we've just sort of rolled over on this top line predator, and it's the coyote's world, and it doesn't matter what property taxes we pay. We're not gonna be protected. I can't let my cats out. I've built walls. I'm not safe with walls. I find coyote scat. I've talked to you, Andrew, before. You're, tr you're a tremendous benefit to the entire community because you did educate me when we initially talked and gave me so much of your time. Um, it's like we've just gone like, oh, I can't do it. I can't let my cats out. I can't have a vegetable garden. I've built walls. I'm not a crazy person. I'm not gonna let my cats go here and there, but I love my pets. I don't like the feeling of, I have a lot of acreage. I don't like the feeling of, at night, I can't go outside at night. We've had so many coyotes, I can't go outside. I don't wanna walk through my own bushes. And yet, the answer is, oh, we, we eradicated wolves. Really? We can't get rid of coyotes? Really? Or protect an area? It's like the long standing joke of like, you know, if there was a nuclear holocaust, what would survive, you know, roaches and coyotes. There, you know, for the longest time when we started settling this country, uh, you know, wolfers, you know, especially out in the West, uh, when free range cattle and livestock would go across the landscape, and there's still quite a control effort there to this day. Um, the wolfers, you know, did their best to eradicate the coyote through the Western Plains and the uh, lower portions of Canada, and they're still there with, with great presence. Um, they have their corrective biology, as, as, as Fallon was explaining, uh, and so they're forever here. Uh, it's just a matter of, of, you know, is it a true issue or, issue or not, and is it something that you want to pay for on a regular basis to have done? Now, I have clients that do that. I go to their property, some on a quarterly basis, and I set traps and catch and remove, you know, coyotes. As I catch and remove a mated pair, six months down the line, another mated pair moves in. 
Uh, sometimes it'll be a year. I may just be catching other predators on the property, but you know they'll move in, in time. More move in, so it's not unlike landscaping. I, I hate it to kind of put it in that category, but the trees and are going to grow. The grass is going to grow. You're going to have to mow it and trim it and mitigate it. So you know if you if you're if it's a legitimate concern, if it's a legitimate problem, um, you know mitigate you know and continual management is key you can't just do it one time and walk away that's not how wildlife management works on any level you know that's why the hunting and trapping seasons are in place however in these suburban and urban environments where you cannot hunt or you know trap uh without you know issuance of permit um you know, that's what you're gonna you know that's probably what you're gonna have to do is, is trap but there again, you know, I think there's a lot of hysteria out there around the animal. The animal, you know, you see the numbers, it's true that, you know, they're not, majority of the time, they're not gonna present an issue. They have a natural fear of people. So um, there's, no, I don't think not going out at night should be a concern. Uh, that, that might be a bit much, but certainly with the pets though, I can tell you from my personal experience. Now, some people might not like me saying this, but cats outdoors, Cats outdoors, you know, they do a lot of damage to native wildlife, flora and fauna. So they kill a lot of songbirds and stuff. Having a cat outdoors free range, it's probably not a good idea, but you roll the dice every time you let that cat outside because they cat and coyotes love cats. Um, the dog thing is, is, is definitely where I think is a bigger issue because I have seen elderly dogs killed by territorial mated coyotes. To, uh, made the parakeets. I have seen them do aggressive things, like like I said, that one. I had a woman in Tiga Cay, South Carolina, where the coyote came through a, a doggy door into the kitchen. Fortunately, it remembered where it came in and scrambled and went right back out. But stuff like that is definitely alarming, causes concern and a lot for alarm. And, and then at that point, and then of course, then at that point, you would take the appropriate met, take the appropriate measures. But um, I don't know. It's, it's the animal control officers, because they've been to my property before. Um, I mean, I, I'll have a coyote standing on my front doorstep at 11 a.m. Yeah. in the morning, looking in at one of my cats. And I mean, they're so nice. The officers that have come out, they're so nice, and I feel badly for them because they say, "Well, I can try to if I can find it, I can try to get it with that little chokehold thing." I said, "Get your gun out." <laughs> they don't have guns. <laughs> but but I mean I, I think it's almost unfair for the animal control officers because how could they respond to a difficult coyote situation without a firearm? We have we have tranquilization methods as well, but I mean that comes down to what I spoke with earlier with the rabies and the injured. We don't use those for that situation. Well, how long does it take for coyotes? if they've been eradicated from that area for another group to move in. My kids, that one guy do they move in, 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 in pairs and mates, or do they move in it, singular? It, it varies, it varies. It depends on the time of the year. Now, the people that I have done, that I do continue to work for, uh, you know, they will, uh, it, it may be six months, it may be a year, um, but usually, when I first started trapping, it was pretty regular. It was like every you know three or four months, another pair or another animal had moved in. Um, now, it depends on the time of year as well. If it's late winter and that ma that mated pair is is breeding and they're defending, and they're usually going to show up in an area together, and that will be evidenced by the you know you'll see that you'll you'll see two of them running together. Um, if it's like right around now, if you notice if you're driving up down 85 and 77 and 485, you're going to see a lot of dead deer this time of year because the deer rut, but you're also going to see a lot of coyote road till because those pups are dispersing out into the ground and, uh, and they're, you know, they're, they're getting a taste of the real world out there. But yeah, this time of year, you know, a lot of times you'll just have that one lone transient animal show up and, and then set up shop. And then through their, you know, their biology and their vocalization and how they how they work, they will find typically find a, a mate and set up shop. But they're going to have to get through other coyotes to 
to, 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 you know, to take over that territory. You know, this morning it was raining really bad, and I went out to take the garbage to the road. I went over to where the small batch of trees are in my yard, and I looked into there, you know, it's just raining. I could, do they bring in their own, like, dens, like their sticks? Because this place was just cleaned out. Can they bring in their own to hide behind? Because it was like a big fort that was built there. I, I, I couldn't believe no. it. The, the den sites I typically see are going to be in thick cover. They either dig them out or they'll take over an old den. They love, in Charlotte, they love dry culvert pipes. That's Jordan Griffin, right? Oh, yeah. yeah they love they'll dry go into like the sewer system. Yeah, the a dry culvert pipe in a kudzu ditch is a coyote's favorite in Charlotte. Wow. I could have sworn, but I've, I've gone out and I've, I've taken your you know, advice. I didn't know really what to do. I, I probably my neighbors think I'm crazy, but I'll go out there and I'll start, you know, if I feel something, I'll start yelling because I, I know they're, they're starting to tear down houses right around us and rebuilding uh, new ones and they're disrupting a lot of things and I think they're, they have been back in, in the wooded areas there, you know, and they're yeah, you know, they taking have. down the trees. And so they're moving, like you said, they'll move in transient around the high. Yeah, I saw them going. I thought it was a fox one last summer, but they were going in and out of the uh, water drain sewer. I don't know if it's sewer or water drain. Yeah, it's like an artificial den to them. You know, yeah, they, yeah. Really well, I, could, I mean, they feel a little, I, it has to be a den, because I looked in there and I'm going, wow. And I had my hiking stick with me, because, you know, it's long, and I was, I was just That's I'm being explaining. very cautious now, and I'm looking. As Kyle was explaining, they even though amongst people they still are secretive, um, they're, they're, they're and they will find those, those green corridors where nobody goes, a, a clover leaf next to a highway, uh, an overlooked spot that you know provides good right. security cover, uh, good proximity to food, because that's real important for them when they have pups, you know, right. in the, or, you know, close to their den. They want to have food nearby because mom and dad will work day and night. So is that why they cut down a lot of people that are transient into Charlotte? Is that why they're cutting down all the trees because they don't want? That probably yeah. That's what I think. Probably not necessarily because of coyotes. I'm sure that's for other reasons. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I guess. But yeah, I no, it's not like they're trying to. Cut but them. I've noticed, and I live in the Cotswold area, and I've noticed an overabundance of coyotes. All this building that's taking place have brought them out, and it's brought the deer out. And I see three, I see two, and now I see one. And I mean, what deer? Deer. And they're they're causing a real problem in that area, in the Myers Park, Cotswold, Foxcroft. You know, area that is. I get calls from all over Charlotte, but the Myers Park, Noda, Villa Heights, and all up and down the Providence Road corridors, you get a lot of calls in there. I'd say one of the benefits, though, having coyotes, they, they will maybe not complete control, but they will help kind of uh, mitigate the deer population. Because you cannot hunt within the city limits of Charlotte. So the deer population you know, just grows and grows. I would say in certain parts, Especially like uh, Mullen Creek and some of those creek systems that run through the Providence Road corridor. And there's probably 60, 40, 45 to 60 deer per square mile in those areas. And so <laughs> the coyote helps, you know, keep their numbers under control. That's one of the benefits, I guess you could say. But uh, yeah, there are a lot of coyotes. They're yeah. here to stay. But, but again, realize they're not like the deer. Though. They don't just keep building in population in an area. Yeah. They're competitive, their success ratio on hunts and, and food, uh, you know, they're not going to want to share it. But that is one of the things I do notice about the urban environments. They're maybe not as territorial because they have trash, they have rodents, they have cats, they have a plethora of food availability. You know, it's not, and I always tell people, and they're like, why don't they just want to, why don't they just go out to the country where there's woods and all this stuff? I said, well, out there, People are hunting them, trapping them. There's incidental, sh you know, sh people taking shots at them while deer hunting or farmers shooting at them. They're competing with other animals. You know, the, the, the habitat is more dictated by, you know, the food availability and the, and the, and the 
quality of the habitat, whereas in an urban environment, nobody's hunting them, nobody's trapping them, they're not harassed, they're kind of king, you know, the, the apex predator. Mm -hmm. And then push out all the red fox, they come in, set up shop, and they're living like kings, nobody harasses them um, or controls their number. That's another thing too that I'll tell people is I'll come in and I'll set traps and catch, I may catch a female or I may catch the male or I may catch a couple pups in the male and the female bounces. She'll leave. She'll, she'll bounce. She'll, may, she may not uh, come back. Uh, she, just, she, just, she may not like never return, but a lot of times they'll leave, they'll go away. So that's kind of another corrective, what I mean by corrective control with trapping. But it just uh, it widely varies. Yeah, there's kind of two points that I want to piggyback on from what Andrew was saying. One, one is that I, I didn't want to take up too much time, but coyotes do fill an important biological niche. Uh, they they are a predator in in an area where the natural predators have been extirpated. You know, we don't we don't have red wolves in Charlotte anymore. We don't have um, we used to have uh, mountain lions, and they've been extirpated. Um, so those those were competing predators, but those animals aren't on the landscape anymore, and so coyotes have filled that biological niche as a predator, and that's an important niche. They perform a really important ecological service by, by helping to manage the populations of those prey species, including um, you know, rabbits, rodents, deer, um, especially if you're talking about the fact that uh, the ticks that transmit Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases are mostly uh, mostly found on mice, coyotes being a predator of mice, they can actually help sort of moderate the spread of the disease. So, you know, coyotes aren't just just this bad guy. It's terrible that they're here. They, they do um, have a good effect in some ways as, as well as the inconveniences that they cause. Um, it's important to see coyotes that wolf urine out to no. that that doesn't work. I was reading something on they're they're not exposed to wolves, so they have no reason to be afraid of wolves. Uh, um, they're they're incredibly smart and they learn quickly. But yeah. if they haven't learned that there's a reason to be afraid of wolf urine because they've never come across yeah. a wolf, then yeah. it's just well, another really interesting good. animal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was just trying to read up some things. Sure. Will they stalk a pet like? You know, I, I, I know, I know this, my cat for months, his whole personality changed. I think once he, he came in and I think he had gotten a good scare or maybe uh, the coyote got a, 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 a hunk of him or something, he wasn't right since. He wouldn't come around corners, he wouldn't. When he changed his whole personality, and then I went out looking for him because I knew his habits and I knew his domain and I knew you know the areas he traveled. And sure, shoot, I mean it was, you could tell this coyote had been laying, you know, and wait. And then I guess the bait came from after he. Grabbed my cat. They both gouged him and ate him from the whole insides of him. Left his head, perfect. Left his legs, and but yet. just ate the whole interior of him. Mark Perry. Yeah. So, so uh, something that again um, I didn't go into too much is, is coyote territory behavior. Part of maintaining territory is traveling on regular routes to freshen up the marks. So they'll set mark along the boundaries of the territory and guard the boundaries of the territory from other coyotes to keep other coyotes out. So they have these regular paths that they travel on a daily basis sometimes. So if every day they come across a cat in the same area yeah. on their daily route, you know, they All might right. remember, like, oh, well, maybe, maybe the cat will be a little bit closer when I come by next time. So, so they, because they, they have these, these patterns, these movement patterns that they do on a regular basis, certainly they, they will learn their environment and learn where the food opportunities are and focus yeah. their attentions in those areas. I kind of figured that. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, that's 
fun, and that's that's what they do. Is they have a now in the what I've noticed in Charlotte is that because food availability is good, pressure is low, you know they instead of having ten square miles that they occupy maybe two, yeah. and there, there might be a, a neighboring the, so the, the territories might be more tolerable and then shrunk and smaller. Uh, but yeah, that's certainly true. They'll run the. That's another reason why if you talk to a wildlife control agent about trapping and they talk about minimums of like a week or two weeks of trapping because it may take three or four days before those coyotes come back through there. Now, if it is during this, the, the pupping season and they have a den nearby, you may see them more frequently, especially since they're more visible trying to feed themselves plus pups. But if you're close to a den site, you probably would see them more frequently. But yeah, they run the gauntlet of their territory uh, on a you know daily basis. In some places they'll st you know stop off at a thicket behind Walmart and hunt rabbits and hang there and loaf there for a few days and then move back over to the other side of their territory. Do you need to secure garbage like our regular garbage cans that we have? Do they get into those? I don't really see it that often. Uh, more of domestic dogs dip, ripping them down and the coyotes falling up maybe, but. I don't, I don't get that a lot of them, like knocking over trash cans. You know, I had I had an incident this morning. Like I said, I, I noticed this, this awful cake I had, so I threw it out in a plastic bag. I found, I've seen possum or, you know, the raccoons, the way they can get stuff out. This was strategically put, sliced open. I don't know, do they slice easily with their teeth? Is it no, or they, do they? Or pulling apart. Well, okay, and they got in, I said, this doesn't look like a raccoon or anything, you know, and, and it laid it there on the other garbage can on top to let me know, yeah, we, we uh, we're around here. It was we're a sign, I know it was a sign. One thing I do want to mention about trash is that even in the Charlotte area, yeah. I'd, be, I'd be worried about bears. Bears do pass through the Charlotte area, and they they definitely hone in on on trash, like sure. waste. So you may have never seen a, a black bear in your neighborhood or heard of one, but they do come through, and they they will definitely go after the trash. So securing that trash is important for okay. all sorts of wildlife. Yeah, I think I've seen a couple in um, in around the, in the area. Just just mm -hmm. I was thinking, am I hallucinating? But no, I'm very <laughs> conscious of animals. You know, and, and I, I really believe I saw a couple. Well, that's why it was July. Yeah, I've seen them out. There was a bear in that area. Yeah. Yeah, like a bear or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't really say much about <laughs> what people think. Oh, I think we, we have a question for somebody who's been watching the, the workshop online. Uh, so uh, it's not so much a question, but maybe something that you can touch on. Um, she says that she feels some of her feral colony cats disappear at times due to coyotes. Um, she takes care of them in Monroe, but Lord knows we have many colonies here in Charlotte. If there is, if we have colony caretakers in Charlotte, many. Um, so if any of them are either watching now or they may watch this later, is there any advice that you can give to them to try to deter, either deter coyotes or just be aware of the fact that they may come through and, and find this colony? Probably. More, more along the, the lines of the second thing you said, which is that you know, coyotes are pretty pervasive across the state, including Charlotte, and they, they do target cats. So for better or for worse, um, there's, there's no way to protect a feral co cat colony from coyote predation if, if the, those animals are outside and unsupervised and unsecured. And the coyotes might be attracted not only to the cats, but to the cat food. So that's, that's a really important thing to consider when you're managing a feral cat colony. And as Andrew said, you know, cats, um, domestic cats are not a natural part of, of the environment and they, they are damaging to native wildlife. Um, so I would always, um, it, it's a hard decision if you're, if you're managing a, a feral cat colony, but I would always kind of weigh, you know, the risks to the, the cats and the risks to the other animals in the environment when you're, when you're managing one of those colonies artificially. You know, with feral cat colonies, you're going to lose some. But if anybody who you know here owns cats knows that they're incredibly tough. You know, they're survivors. Um, that's any consolation. Yeah. But 
that's just the risk you take. Whether you let your cat out or you maintain a wild cat colony, uh, is that you know they are going to be low down. They're going to turn the trophic levels, and they're going to be considered prey to the coyotes. And you roll the dice by letting them go out there. Yeah. And then feral cats, you know, pretty much you can say they're wild. You know, yeah. they're either going to fend for themselves or not. But the side note to it all is that in, in being a wildlife manager or being a biologist is the impact that cats have on the environment. That's you know, that's a, that's a big concern. Are there any more online questions? Just that one? Um, okay, I think we, we actually, so we're, this is supposed to be done at eight, so, so we're seven, it's over. So um, I think I, I'm gonna hang around for a little bit more, but I think that's, uh, we're ready to wrap it up and anybody can stick around to ask more questions if you like, but uh, thank you very much for attending and being here and anybody who was watching online, I hope you learned a lot and again, spread the word. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.